1985, amidst the sprawling landscapes of Sacramento, California, resided Kevin O'Keefe, a 36-year-old man whose heart beat for the great outdoors. His spirit was ever drawn to the call of the wild, a passion that was deeply rooted within his adventurous soul. Kevin wasn't just an outdoor enthusiast. He was a man who found solace in the embrace of nature, a sanctuary in the whispering woods, and freedom in the rugged trails that he often trod. His dreams were painted with visions of the Alaskan wilderness, a frontier known for its pristine beauty and untamed wilderness. It was a place where nature spoke in its purest form, and life thrived away from the clutches of civilization. For Kevin, Alaska was not just a destination. It was a calling that he yearned to answer. As the summer of 1985 approached, Kevin found himself immersed in meticulous research, seeking a haven in Alaska that resonated with his adventurous spirit. His quest led him to Glacier Bay National Park, a realm of nature that, even by Alaskan standards, was renowned for its wilderness and sheer remoteness. It was a land where glaciers stood sovereign and the echoes of wildlife reverberated in the crisp air. Understanding the perils that the Alaskan wilderness presented, especially when braving it alone, Kevin was prudent. He enrolled in a survival class specifically tailored for the challenges of the Alaskan wilds. He wasn't just a dreamer, he was a planner, a survivor, a man who respected nature's might and knew the importance of preparation. On September 20th, 1985, with resolve in his heart and excitement coursing through his veins, Kevin journeyed from Sacramento to Juneau, Alaska. From there, he traversed the rugged paths leading to Glacier Bay National Park. Upon his arrival, he introduced himself to the park rangers, sharing his plans to venture into the solitude near Wolf Point, a serene locale by the water's edge. He intended to immerse himself in this wilderness and escape until October 10th, a three-week journey into nature's heart. However, as the days passed, a silence fell over Kevin's expected whereabouts. No word came from him, no sign of his presence, but concern was not immediate. After all, this trip was his escape, a hiatus from reality, a communion with nature in its rawest form. The tranquility of the scenario was disrupted on October 8th, two days shy of Kevin's intended departure. Park rangers, patrolling the waterways near Wolf Point, decided to check on the solitary camper. What they discovered unnerved them. Kevin's tent, disheveled, misplaced from its original setting, with personal gear scattered not chaotically, but noticeably outside. The tent structure was compromised, with a central strut noticeably damaged. Calls for Kevin reverberated through the wilderness, but only silence greeted them. The rangers, though puzzled, initially conjectured that Kevin might be preparing for his return journey, or perhaps had ventured out on a brief hike. Their concern escalated when a return visit the next day revealed an unchanged scene. The campsite lay untouched, the gear remained unmoved, and Kevin's absence grew more ominous. It was clear something was wrong. A comprehensive search ensued, with planes soaring over the wilderness and search teams scouring the ground accompanied by dogs. Despite their exhaustive efforts, Kevin seemed to have vanished into thin air. Strangely, all of his essential equipment, including a fully packed backpack, was found at the campsite. More bizarre was the untouched food, an anomaly in the wild, where creatures were often lured by the scent of the sustenance. The mystery deepened when search dogs discovered Kevin's boots, glove liner, and hat concealed in a gully a half a mile from his camp. There were no signs of a struggle, no evidence of an animal attack, an aspect further corroborated by the untouched food and the absence of wildlife activity around his campsite. Desperate for answers, investigators approached Kevin's family, seeking insights into his state of mind or any underlying intentions. However, all they received were affirmations of Kevin's positive disposition, his excitement for the trip, and his thorough preparations. There was no inkling of despair, no desire for self-harm, no plans for anything but solitude in the embrace of nature. Yet, the man who had ventured into the wild with dreams in his eyes and a love for nature in his heart had disappeared, leaving behind a trail of questions and a shroud of mystery. 
what had transpired at that desolate campsite. What force had been responsible for the disarray and the relocation of the tent, and also the abandoned gear? If not for the ferocity of wildlife, then why would have Kevin disappeared? The wilderness holds its secrets closely, and in the case of Kevin O'Keefe, the answers remain concealed. His story, like many tales of those who seek communion with the untamed, serves as a reminder of nature's unpredictable character and the mysteries that dwell within its depths. In the year 2000, the wilderness had a familiar face in Patrick Whalen, a 33-year-old whose life was deeply intertwined with the great outdoors. More than just an enthusiast, Patrick was a seasoned survivalist, his soul resonating with the untamed heart of nature. His footprints had marked thousands of miles along the Pacific Crest Trail, and his presence was a familiar one amidst the National Park's sprawling expanses. Among these, Glacier National Park in Montana stood as his ultimate sanctuary, a place so frequented by him that the very contours of its landscape were etched in his heart, and his face known by the park rangers. Patrick's story took an unexpected turn on November 2nd of 2000 in Kiowa Junction, Montana. That day, fate intervened in the form of a deer crossing his path while he was driving. Witnesses recounted the compassion he showed towards the injured creature, pulling it to the roadside, cushioning its head with a pillow, and even offering it food from his own provisions. Then, in a move that puzzled onlookers, Patrick just walked away from the scene, leaving his truck behind, its fate to be towed away the following day. Whether this act was born from a sudden disdain for worldly possessions or a mechanical failure was unclear. The narrative fast forward six months, painting a picture of a concerned father reaching out to the rangers at Glacier National Park. His son Patrick had fallen off the grid and his last known haven was the wilderness that he loved so much. Despite their familiarity with Patrick, the rangers had no sightings to report but promised to keep their eyes open. Only a few weeks later, during a routine patrol, the rangers stumbled upon an eerie sight, a lone blue tent its fabric beaten by the elements, yet strangely intact. It stood desolate in a campsite. The tent structure was compromised, its middle strut collapsed, hinting at long-term abandonment. Yet, a peek inside revealed an array of typical camping gear, all perfectly preserved. Water, food, stove, boots, clothes, everything a camper would need was there, except for the camper himself. What baffled the rangers was the untouched state of the tent, especially the food inside. It was as if the wild inhabitants, known for scavenging, had decided to respect the sanctity of this lone human abode. The authorities were summoned and a search commenced, but it was like Patrick had vanished into thin air. Cadaver dogs found no scent and the mystery deepened when they discovered his truck still sitting in the tow yard, unclaimed since the deer incident. Among this mystery, one particular detail sent chills down the spines of the investigators. An empty buck knife case. It was as if Patrick had sensed a threat formidable enough to arm himself and step out into the dark, wild night. But what was that he faced? There were no signs of a violent struggle. No blood, no remains. The food in his tent remained undisturbed, countering the theory of a wild animal attack. Investigators also proposed a chilling theory. Patrick, possibly alerted by an ominous sound, might have confronted something outside his tent. The heavy mosquito presence suggested he wouldn't have left it open for long. Knife in hand, he would have faced whatever or whoever was out there, never to return to the safety of his shelter. The wilderness, with its unspoken laws, holds tightly onto this mystery. In the case of Patrick Whalen, questions remain unanswered. If it wasn't the claws or jaws of a wild animal that led to his mysterious disappearance, then what was it that lurked in the shadows that night? What compelled a seasoned survivalist to step out into the unknown, leaving behind everything but his courage and his knife? The whispers of the wild carry tales told and untold and the hushed tones between the rustling leaves and the howling winds, the story of Patrick Whalen remains an unsolved mystery, a haunting lullaby in the symphony of the great outdoors.
In the spring of 1976, the call of adventure echoed in the heart of 19-year-old Stephen Thomas, an ardent hiker whose passion for the great outdoors was about to lead him on a mysterious journey. His close friend, Bruce Weber, extended an invitation to him to join him and four acquaintances on a hiking expedition in the rugged terrains of New York State. Despite not knowing the others, Stephen's bond with Bruce and his love for hiking propelled him to accept the offer. Their destination was Mount Marcy, a towering behemoth among the peaks of the East Coast, known for its unforgiven terrain, biting winds, and plummeting temperatures as one ascended towards its summit. It was a mountain that demanded respect and caution, its treacherous paths and unpredictable weather posing a challenge even to the most experienced hikers. On the morning of departure, a shadow of foreboding loomed as Stephen's mother expressed her apprehensions. She harbored an ominous feeling about the trek, particularly since Stephen would be in the company of strangers on such a perilous journey. However, confident in his hiking ability and by the excitement of the adventure ahead, Stephen reassured her of his safety and set out with promises of returning in a few days. On April 12th, 1976, the group of six made their ascent up Mount Marcy, reaching near the summit by late afternoon. Despite the allure of the peak, exhaustion weighed heavily upon them, and they collectively decided to set up camp and postpone the final climb to the following day. All were content with this decision, except for Stephen. Relentlessness seemed to grip him as he sat in Bruce's tent, poring over the map of Mount Marcy. A burning desire to continue was evident in his eyes. He proposed a brief, impromptu trek up the path to Bruce, who, drained from the day's hike, suggested they wait until morning. Undeterred, Stephen continued to study the map, sipping tea, until he finally resolved to take a quick solo walk up the trail, promising to return shortly. Bruce, concerned, advised against it, citing the plummeting temperatures, encroaching darkness, and fierce winds. But Stephen, perhaps driven by an inexplicable compulsion, was adamant, donning just a yellow rain jacket over his t-shirt and pants, and leaving behind his essential gear, he ventured out into the night. The conditions were oddly in his favor, and the snow was hard packed under the full moon's illumination, providing good visibility. The other hikers, though irked by his decision, were not worried. Stephen had a wealth of hiking experience under his belt, and the night, though cold, was clear. They expected him back in mere minutes. However, as darkness fully settled and the temperature sank below freezing, an hour passed with no sign of Stephen. His light attire was grossly inadequate for the frigid night, prompting the hikers to initiate a search. But before they embarked, they encountered an inexplicable problem. One hiker's usually energetic dog, which accompanied them on the hike, was suddenly petrified, refusing to leave the tent and appearing terrified of an entity outside cowering in the corner. This behavior was unprecedented, according to the dog's owner, and it added an eerie layer to Stephen's disappearance. Despite the dog's fear, the man ventured out, calling for Stephen, concern growing with each unanswered call. The perilous night conditions eventually forced them back to their tents, hoping that Stephen had found refuge somewhere on the mountain. Dawn broke with no sign of Stephen, prompting a split in the group. Half embarked on a four-hour trek to get help, while others continued to search near the camp. What followed was one of the most extensive search and rescue operations in New York State history spanning two weeks with helicopters, dog teams, and ground searchers, combing the mountain to no avail. Stephen, despite his bright yellow jacket, seemed to have vanished into thin air. Refusing to give up, Stephen's 26-year-old brother, Bob, took up the mantle of the search. In peak physical condition and driven by his love for his brother, he dedicated an entire year to scouring Mount Marcy becoming so familiar with its terrain that veteran park rangers joked that he knew it better than they did. Despite summoning over 600 times and covering more than 2,500 miles, Bob never found any signs of Stephen. 
However, his relentless search did lead to the discovery of another lost hiker's remains, bringing closure to a different grieving family. The mystery surrounding Stephen's disappearance proposed several haunting questions. What compelled him to venture alone into that treacherous night? What invisible terror kept the dog cowering in the corner of the tent, a fear so intense it chose isolation over following its owner? And how could Stephen, in his bright attire, elude detection, even after such an exhaustive search? The logical conclusion seems impossible. Stephen was not on the mountain, but if not there, where had he gone? Like many missing person cases in the wilderness, the answers remain elusive, lost perhaps to the wilderness itself. Yet, the human spirit's relentless quest for understanding persists, fueling theories and speculation about Stephen's fate on that fateful night in April of 1976. The Strange Disappearance of Mike Heron from the Great Smoky Mountains. It would definitely be considered a cold case. My mind has gone a hundred different ways. Anytime, of course, with all the hope we have of, of finding them, you know, anytime we hear something, you start to believe it. Michael Edwin Heron, known as Mike, who was 51 years old, was last spotted on his four-wheel drive ATV at approximately 11 a.m. on August 23, 2008, heading towards a densely wooded area close to his 100-acre residence on Bell Branch Road in Blunt County, Tennessee. The location is adjacent to the boundary of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. The Bell Branch is a small, just a really small road, single lane. It borders uh, the National Park. It's sort of back in the corner. So it's, it's really secluded and, and uh, away from everything. Following an extensive search of the vicinity near his home, no evidence was discovered except for his abandoned ATV, which had its keys in the ignition, was in high gear, and had the kill switch turned off. There were no footprints, ripped pieces of clothing, noticeable paths through the dense vegetation, blood stains, body tissue, or skeletal remains found in the area, indicating that Mike had never been there. The authorities presumed that he had either been abducted or lost in the forest, while the family suspects that criminal activity was at play. Despite the passage of time, no new evidence has surfaced, leaving the question of what occurred to Mike Heron on that fateful day in August 2008 in the wilderness around Happy Valley, Tennessee, unanswered. I believe it. Your mind's just going over so many different things and you have so many different ideas and just so many questions that you just want to answer. Mike Heron who was roughly five foot, 10 inches tall and weighed approximately 185 pounds, was last seen wearing a faded red t-shirt, khaki cargo shorts, and sandals when he disappeared. Had a snake bite scar on one of his feet, a surgical scar on the back of his knee, and a noticeable tattoo on his lower back along with a few dental caps. Besides having mild high blood pressure, Mike was in good physical shape. He was a native of East Tennessee and attended Lanier High School where he played football. Following high school, he worked as a trail trimmer for the Park Service before starting a successful home building company, Mike Heron Builders, which his sons Matt and Andy also worked for. The company had sold much of its housing inventory in 2007 prior to the housing market crash of 2008 and 9, and there were no apparent financial difficulties. Mike was familiar with the Happy Valley region and owned a 100 acre farm with cattle. He enjoyed exploring caves and venturing deep into the nearby Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Happy Valley is an unincorporated community in Blunt County, Tennessee, with approximately 500 inhabitants. It lies within a narrow valley, bearing the same name on the northwestern border of the Great Smoky Mountains. Happy Valley Road is the primary road access to the area, linking U.S. Route 129 with the Look Rocks section of the Foothills Parkway. The Great Smoky Mountains National Park spans 522,419 acres and covers the ridgeline of the Blue Ridge Mountains, including the Great Smoky Mountains. Often shortened to the Smokies, this park center is crossed by the border between Tennessee and North Carolina, running from the northeast to the southwest. It was established by the United States Congress in 1934 and officially dedicated by President Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1940. The park features some of the highest mountains in the eastern part of the United States. The Appalachian Trail, which runs from Georgia to Maine, passes through the park. The Great Smoky Mountains National Park is the most visited national park in the United States, with 12.5 million visitors in 2019. 
Mike's sons, Andy and Matt, were last in contact with him on Saturday, August 23rd, 2008. At around 9.30 a.m., Mike called his son Andy to inform him that he was leaving his condo in Maryville, Tennessee and would be coming over to his house to collect a lawnmower and trailer for cutting grass on a property in Happy Valley. He called me Saturday morning just to, just to kind of let me know he was going to head up over the mountain for the, you know, to, for the weekend, nothing out of the ordinary. Although Andy was not home when his father called, he offered to help him load the mower onto the trailer. Matt, Mike's other son, received a voicemail from Mike with the same message. Mike regularly visited his farm in Happy Valley and was eager to mow the grass on a 40-acre neighboring property owned by missionaries who had been away for some time. Andy told his dad he could go ahead and transport the mower by himself if he didn't want to wait because they only lived about a half hour apart. So he would either see his dad loading the mower and help him or pass him on the drive. On his way home, Andy passed his dad on Gateway Road and Mike had the mower and was likely heading towards Bell Branch Road. Later that morning, around 11 a.m., Mike's neighbor saw him pull into his driveway. His neighbor described it as he was hauling a piece of equipment on a trailer. 30 minutes later, they saw him on his four-wheeler ATV, and he waved as he drove down Bell Branch Road. Matt and Andy assumed their dad would call and return the mower and trailer to one of them when he was done, and they went on with their weekends. On Sunday, August 24th, their grandmother Alma called around 2 p.m. concerned that she hadn't heard from Mike and couldn't reach him on his cell phone, even though cell phone reception in Happy Valley was almost non-existent. I was starting to worry when we were driving up there, just because of the whole fact that we were having to drive up there, it was just odd, you know. Earlier that morning, Alma, Mike's mother, had walked with Matt and Andy from their house on Happy Valley Road to Mike's house on Bell Branch Road, but there was no response when they knocked on his door. They saw Mike's truck in the driveway with a mower and trailer attached, just as their grandfather had seen it earlier that weekend. They also noticed that the lawn had not been mowed. However, Matt and Andy weren't too worried as their father often spent time away from the house taking care of the cattle or working on the farm. The next day, on August 25th, Alma called again and expressed her concern that she still hadn't heard from Mike. This alarmed Matt and Andy, and they decided to check on their father. Matt first went to Mike's condo on Brown Court in Maryville where he stayed during the week for work. There, he found two of Mike's three vehicles in the garage, but nothing seemed out of place. After checking the condo, Matt met up with Andy, and they both went to the farm on Bell Branch Road. Alma had gone back to the farmhouse to check on Mike, but she didn't find him. When Andy and Matt arrived, they saw that Mike's ATV was still in the front yard, and his truck was parked with a lawnmower and trailer attached to the back. Upon closer inspection, they found that the windows of the truck were down, the doors were unlocked, and Mike's keys, ID, and money clip were still inside the vehicle, which was very strange. Matt and Andy came to the realization that the old ATV their grandmother had seen on Mike's property was still there, while the new one that Mike had recently purchased was missing. In addition, Mike's truck was parked in an unusual position, as it was normally moved before the school bus arrived on Monday mornings. Matt was particularly worried about the missing ATV, because it suggested that Mike may have been in an accident and unable to return to the farm. On Monday, August 25th, around noon, the men informed some of the close family members of Mike's disappearance and contacted their mother, who drove to Happy Valley to help them search. Matt and Andy began searching their father's property by repairing a flat tire on an old ATV and driving through all the ATV trails and nearby campgrounds in the National Park. They were unable to find any signs of their dad. Around 3 or 4 p.m., Matt and Andy called 911, reporting their father Mike missing to the National Park Service, who transferred the report to the Blunt County Sheriff's Office. Blunt County that was the first call, then immediately to the Blunt County Sheriff's Department, and then within probably an hour or two, uh, they had met us over at his house. Between 6 and 7 p.m., search teams from the Sheriff's Office arrived to the farm talked to Mike's friends in the neighborhood and attempted to track him with a sniffer dog. However, the search was interrupted by heavy rain that persisted for several days. The search teams agreed to meet with the family before daylight the following morning to continue the search for Mike. Uh, we were calling out to his house. I remember it was, it was raining. That's where the old one was parked right there. Got everybody together on Tuesday morning very early and um, that's when we were doing the grid searches and all of that and Tuesday I think, you know, around lunchtime is when they had found the four-wheeler. It was just really oddly placed. 
uh, didn't really find a whole lot of evidence. We grew up riding fullers and dirt bikes. Me and my brother did, and my dad and all of us did. And, you know, when you turn something off, you know, that has an ignition switch and a key, you turn it, you turn the key off or it'll drain the battery, you know, the lights and stuff. Gary Whitehead, one of Mike's neighbors who lived on Bell Branch Road, offered to lead search parties despite being in his 80s. When Mike went missing, Grady caught a glimpse of him as he drove past his house on his ATV and waved at him. The Heron and Whitehead families shared a close bond, having worked as a park ranger in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park for more than three decades. Grady was well versed with the terrain and possessed excellent tracking skills, and he couldn't believe Mike would just go missing. He was confident in his ability to locate Mike because the thick vegetation and habitat would leave a telltale sign, like flattened leaves, snapped twigs, and crushed bushes if someone had walked through an area or taken a tumble and then tried to seek help. On Tuesday, August 26th, a friend discovered his missing ATV around 12.05 p.m. near Happy Valley Loop, a road leading to Bell Branch Road and about a mile from Mike's residence. The ATV was in an uncommon location near an abandoned cabin and close to the National Park, but not inside of it appeared to have been abandoned in a hurry or purposely ditched in the thick brush. The vehicle was undamaged and still had fuel in the tank, but it was found in high gear on a steep hill with the ignition switch on and the kill switch off, which was unusual behavior for Mike. Matt, Mike's son, noted that his father would never leave an ATV on as it would drain the battery. Upon seeing the ATV, Matt and his brother knew it was their father's, but they had no explanation as to why it was in that location. They immediately suspected foul play. The next day, over 50 community volunteers and deputies searched the area where the ATV was found. The search proved fruitless as no trace of Mike or any clues were found. The rain made it difficult to gather any forensic evidence and the searchers could not find any footprints or a trail in the thick underbrush. Dogs were not able to pick up a scent and there was no evidence of an animal attack, a struggle or any foul play. The searchers found no torn bits of clothing, blood, tissue or bones. It was as if Mike had just disappeared without a trace. Around 450 acres were searched by hundreds of volunteers and officials, with some of the area searched more than once, including aerial searches with the help of the Knox County Sheriff's Office helicopter, cadaver dogs from North Carolina, sheriff's deputies on horseback, private citizens with horses, ATVs, and grid searches in the backcountry on foot. The search also covered about 50 miles of hiking trails, and drones were used to map the area. The sheriff's office even brought in divers to search two ponds on Mike's property. No signs of human decay were detected by the cadaver dogs when they were brought in the following Wednesday. The official search for Mike Heron was called off by the Blunt County Sheriff's Office on Friday, August 29, 2008. In January 2009, another search was conducted and an article of clothing was found near the location where Mike's ATV was discovered. However, it did not match Mike's. Some bones were also discovered in a fire pit not far from the ATV location, but they were determined to be from a cow. Despite the thorough search, no trace of Mike, his clothes, or his belongings has been found in the woods around where the ATV was located. Friends and family have conducted searches in the years since his disappearance, but nothing has turned up. As a result, Matt and Andy organized an annual hike called Hike for Mike along with the trails near Mike's property in Happy Valley. Despite a $15,000 reward, no new leads have been found. According to both his sons, Mike Heron would have never have willingly left his family. Andy Heron, who had been married to his wife Casey for about three months at the time of Mike's disappearance, said that his father was a family-oriented person who loved the outdoors and the Bell Branch property. Matt Heron also expressed his belief that his father did not simply walk away, citing his close relationship with his mother and his excitement about becoming a grandfather. Matt also ruled out the possibility of suicide, stating that his father did not suffer from depression and had no financial or personal enemies. The ATV's ignition being left on suggests that Mike may have abruptly left the trail due to encountering or hearing something in the woods, or being confronted with someone or something that caused him to immediately abandon his vehicle. There are some speculations that Mike disappeared as a result of a drug deal gone wrong or after stumbling upon an illegal marijuana farm. The disappearance of Mike Heron is a tragic and unresolved case that has left his family and the community with more questions than answers. Despite extensive searches and investigations by law enforcement, no trace of Mike has been found. Lots and stuff. 
We get leads, we get tips, and we follow up on all of them. Just, you know, we, we get tips up until like um, a couple months ago we had tips and we followed up on them. Thought of a lot of different details, but um, but I, there's no point in going there because there's just it's just unknown. We don't believe there's not any scenario that I've ran to believe that he's still be alive. You know, I believe that he's he's dead. No, it's it's hard to believe. It's been 14 years. I'm just proud we've all made it through. This case has led to various theories about what happened to Mike, ranging from foul play to accidental injury or encountering something dangerous in the woods. However, none of these theories have been confirmed, leaving the fate of Mike Heron a mystery. This story serves as a reminder of the importance of being safe and taking precautions when venturing into the wilderness. It's crucial to always inform someone of your planned route, bring necessary supplies and equipment, and to avoid unknown or potentially dangerous areas. Accidents can happen, and it's important to take measures to ensure your safety and the safety of others. In southeastern Arizona, nestled amongst the remote Chiricahua Mountains, lies a vast and rugged expanse of land known as the Chiricahua National Monument. This area is characterized by steep gullies, canyons, jagged rocks, and massive boulders balancing atop each other, creating a landscape that resembles the moonscape of some alien world. Despite its otherworldly appearance, the Chiricahua National Monument is part of a national park system. It holds a place on the National Register of Historic Places and is renowned for its natural beauty and unique rock formations. Visitors to this area can experience the wild and often lethal beauty of this land by hiking its scenic trails. However, the Chiricahua National Monument is also known for one of the most puzzling unsolved national park disappearances on record. The disappearance in question involved Paul Fugate, who at the time was a 41-year-old law enforcement ranger working for the National Park Service and stationed at the Chiricahua National Monument. Fugate was known for his enthusiasm as a ranger, his love for adventure, and his experience as a hiker. He was also highly knowledgeable of the region's terrain and geology. On January 13, 1980, a Sunday afternoon, Fugate told a seasonal staff member working with him at the Park Visitor Center that he was going to check the trail leading to a new 400-acre parcel of land acquired by the park called Faraway Ranch. After telling the staff member to close down without him if he wasn't back by 4.30 p.m., Paul Fugate, a seasoned park ranger, set out on the well-marked trail to the Faraway Ranch in his full ranger uniform and badge. It was supposed to be a quick hike, and Fugate didn't even bother to take his radio with him. He waved goodbye and casually walked out of sight. He then seemingly disappeared off the face of the earth. This would be the last confirmed time anyone would see him. When Fugate failed to return on time, a search was launched that involved tracking dogs, aircraft, and hundreds of law enforcement personnel from various agencies, including the National Park Service, the local sheriff's department, the Bureau of Land Management, the U.S. Forest Service, and the Southern Arizona Search and Rescue Association. Family members and volunteers also joined in on the search, starting with the trail at a Faraway Ranch, where no trace of Fugate could be found. Despite the search expanding to cover 17 square miles of rough and rugged terrain, Law enforcement authorities became increasingly desperate to locate Fugate and posted a $5,000 reward, which quickly ballooned to $20,000. However, none of this produced any leads. The only clue that seemed promising was from a witness who, under hypnosis, claimed to have seen Fugate unconscious in a truck between two unidentified men. There was absolutely no corroborating evidence to support this, and the witness himself admitted he could have been mistaken. The vehicle was traveling very fast, and ultimately, this lead led nowhere. Although it was widely assumed that Fugate had met with foul play, there was no concrete evidence to support this theory also. As the search for Fugate continued, various theories circulated about his disappearance. The most popular theory suggested that Fugate had stumbled upon drug dealers in the area and was either kidnapped or murdered, but once again, there was no evidence to support this. Another theory suggested that Fugate may have been attacked by a wild animal, 
or had suffered an injury from falling, but considering his experience as a ranger, it was considered unlikely. Another possible theory was that Fugate intentionally disappeared. One clue that supported this theory was his instruction to the visitor center staff to close the center if he had not returned by 4.30 p.m., suggesting that he knew he might not be back. However, Fugate's family has challenged the theory that he abandoned his post, as he had left all his money and belongings at his home, as well as an expensive car he had been restoring and his beloved camera equipment. Paul and Doty's longtime friend Barbara Elfbrand admits the mystery is often on her mind. I, I don't have the belief that I did originally that uh, it would be solved. All the good clues or breakthroughs have led to walls which they can never couldn't get through. I know that Paul didn't just leave on his own and I would like to know what happened to him and it would be closure, it would be peace. Fugate's disappearance is still one of the most puzzling unsolved National Park's vanishings on record. In 1986, the National Park Service officially declared Fugate deceased, despite having no conclusive evidence of his death. There have been criticisms of the authorities' handling of the case, including accusations that they did not take appropriate measures, such as extending the search area beyond the parkland, and that the FBI did not take the case seriously enough and tried to dismiss it. Despite the lack of evidence, rumors and theories about Fugate's disappearance have continued to circulate. Some have speculated that he stumbled upon drug dealers in the area and was killed or kidnapped, while others have suggested that he may have been attacked by a wild animal or intentionally disappeared. While there is no concrete evidence to support any of these theories, the mystery surrounding Fugate's disappearance has yet to be fully resolved. In June of 2018, the National Park Service made a surprising move by reopening the decades-old case of Paul Fugate's disappearance. This announcement was made suddenly and without explanation. But it came with a substantial increase in the reward for information, which now stands at $60,000. The National Park Service cited the discovery of new evidence as the reason for this decision, although no specifics were given. The sudden reopening of the case has raised questions and speculation about what this new evidence could be and whether it is significant enough to bring the case to a close. When the National Park Service was asked about the new evidence, they replied with, quote, we have no new information and respectfully decline to interview at this time. The fact that Fugate's case was reopened after so many years is unusual, and it suggests that authorities have reason to believe that they may finally be able to solve this mystery. However, whether this means that they are close to finding Fugate or discovering what happened to him remains to be seen. The circumstances surrounding his disappearance are murky and riddled with theories, rumors, and speculation. The lack of evidence or leads has made it challenging for investigators to determine what really happened to Fugate. What makes this case particularly strange is that most National Park Service rangers who have gone missing have been found, or at least some trace of them have been discovered. However, in Fugate's case, there is no concrete evidence to indicate what might have happened to him. Despite the renewed interest in the effort to solve this case, it seems that the disappearance of Paul Fugate remained a baffling mystery at least for the time being. At 64 years old, Randy Morganson had been a backcountry ranger at the Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks for 28 seasons, making him the most experienced ranger in the High Sierra. On July 21st, 1996, he wrote a note on his tent, but we mistakenly wrote June 21st instead of July, indicating that he would be gone for a few days and left his station near Bench Lake without his Smith & Wesson 357 Magnum. Unfortunately, Randy never returned and was never seen alive again. Randy had grown weary of dealing with what he referred to as Swinus Americanus, a type of backpacking tourist whose trash he had to clean up and whose bad behavior often caused him great frustrations. Sadly, this story involves the infidelity and the death of a highly experienced seasonal park ranger who had dedicated much of his life to the National Park Service. 
Located in the Southern Sierra Nevada, California, Kings Canyon National Park boasts several impressive natural features, including the glacier carved Kings Canyon, which is over a mile deep. Numerous peaks reaching over 14,000 feet, expansive meadows and high mountain areas, fast moving rivers, and some of the world's largest collection of giant sequoia trees. Kings Canyon lies north and adjacent to Sequoia National Park, and both parks are jointly managed by the National Park Service under the name of Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks. Additionally, Sequoia National Park can be found in the Southern Sierra Nevada regions, east of Visalia, California, and covers an area of 404,064 acres, which includes Mount Whitney, reaching a height of 14,505 feet above sea level within its boundaries. The park is particularly famous for its giant sequoia trees, among which the General Sherman tree, the largest tree on earth. The giant forest in the park is also home to five of the 10 biggest trees in the world. Running from north to south, the Pacific Crest Trail slash John Muir Trail combined route is a favorite among backpackers and spans an entire length of the park. Approximately 99% of the park's backcountry visitors tend to stick to its designated trails, which results in a vast majority of the park's terrain being managed and maintained by the backcountry rangers. Randy had a deep aversion to the unsightly mess that visitors would leave behind while exploring the park's pristine wilderness, which he dubbed Backpacker Detritus. In 1973, McCure Metal Log he wrote about the importance of taking the path less traveled and not always seeking the easiest route in life. Randy encouraged readers to embrace their adventurous spirit and not rely on the trail signs or sturdy bridges. He urged people to seek out the beauty of the mountains for themselves and to be open to finding the goodness in whatever they encountered. According to him, the park was a place to be free from the constraints of everyday life and to live by whim, allowing oneself to get lost, fall into creeks, and discover beautiful places. Prior to the 1996 season, Randy expressed a sense of melancholy to his colleagues, questioning whether as many years as a ranger had been worth it. The sentiment wasn't surprising, as he had recently received divorce papers from his wife, Judy. Although she had joined him in the backcountry for many years, she had chosen not to accompany him in recent times. Randy had also been involved in an affair with a fellow ranger named Lo Linus, which had resulted in the divorce papers. He confided in a close friend and fellow rangers that he sometimes felt suicidal. On July 20th, 1996, he radioed this same colleague and his wife, asking mundane questions that were interpreted as Randy simply wanting someone to talk. The conversation was brief and it ended abruptly when Randy stated, I won't be bothering you two anymore. The following day, Randy left his camp and was never seen alive again. While Randy was recognized for his minimal impact on the environment, the rainfall during the late July period made it difficult to determine where he was headed. Ranger Rick Sanger, a second year backcountry ranger, became concerned when Randy didn't check in via radio for several days. Rick hiked through the night to Randy's duty station at Bench Lake and found a note indicating that he had not returned from a cross-country patrol and was now considered missing. This was reported on July 25th, 1996. The news of Randy's disappearance triggered one of the most grueling search and rescue missions in National Park Service history, particularly because the Rangers were searching for one of their own. Randy Kaufman, who was the incident commander, instructed the search teams to refer to Morganson's logbook for any clues about Randy's whereabouts. He also held a secret vote among them to assign a POA, probability of area, and a ROW, rest of world, probability to each section of the search area, in case Randy was located outside of the designated search area. It was mandatory for the total percentage points assigned to each ranger to add up to 100 and no ranger could assign a zero to any area among the 16 segments and the ROW segment. The Bench Lake Basin area had the highest POA percentage of 26.2%, with Marion Lake and its surrounding areas as the second highest at 19.2%. Ranger George Durkee, a close friend of Randy, was the only one who assigned a high percentage to the ROW option, knowing Randy's depressive thoughts at the time. 
Each segment, ranging from 500 to 7,000 acres, made the operation challenging and hazardous for the rescuers. The possibility of Randy not wanting to be found also loomed over the mission. Around 100 rescue personnel combed 80 square miles of wilderness, hoping that Randy's radio was malfunctioning or broken, or it was in a dead zone, or maybe his car had failed. Also, there were no signs of withdrawals from his bank account or usage of his credit cards. A special investigator discovered that Randy had several threats of violence twice, but both alleged perpetrators had alibis. CASIE, a computer program designed to simplify the calculations involving managing a search emergency, was used to monitor the search. However, the program was limited to surface areas and didn't factor in underground, underwater, or rock slide locations. Despite the efforts of the search team, including dogs and a FLIR helicopter equipped with infrared cameras, no trace of Randy was found. The search was eventually called off and it was suspected that Randy had left the area to start a new life away from the National Park Service. Thirteen days after Randy's disappearance, a letter addressed to Randy and Judy Morganson's home arrived, postmarked two days after his reported disappearance. This sparked suspicion as there was no postal service in the National Park and it was unclear how Randy could have sent the letter. The official search was called off in early August 1996 with no sign of Randy. After five years since the search for Randy was halted, a member of the trial building crew from California Conservation Corps, age 19, discovered some remains in July 2001. The young worker uncovered the new evidence near a creek situated in a gorge within the Widow Peak drainage area. The location was near the edge of the search area below the pools of a waterfall. Rangers were called in and discovered a tattered shirt with Morganson's badge, a backpack with a buckle fastened, and a boot with something white protruding from it. It was a leg bone. Upon closer inspection, the boot and pack seemed to match the description of gear that Randy was using when he went missing. Investigation and recovery teams were flown in, and a functioning park issue radio was found on top of the falls. The discovery confused investigators even more because rangers remembered searching the gorge and crossing that exact spot when the radio was found. Although these remains seemed to confirm that Randy had been in the mountains the whole time, investigators were unsure whether this was where he died. Retired Sierra Subdirect Ranger Alden Nash believes that Randy had fallen through a snow bitch, broken his leg, and his body had been hidden beneath the ice throughout the search. In an eerie coincidence, during the rescue attempt in 1996, Judy had a dream of a dead man floating in a lake. Randy may have wanted to appear up died on the job to make sure Judy, his wife at the time, got a $100,000 benefit from the government, a policy not honored in the case of suicide. The disappearance of Randy Morganson provided several valuable lessons, including preparation is key. Randy was an experienced backcountry ranger, but he still encountered unexpected circumstances that led to his disappearance. It's important to be well prepared with appropriate gear, supplies, and knowledge before heading out to the wilderness. Safety procedures should always be followed. Rangers and other backcountry personnel must always follow established safety procedures, including regular communication check-ins and strict adherence to established protocols. The importance of search and rescue operations. The extensive and emotionally draining search and rescue operation for Randy shows how critical these operations are in helping locate and recover missing persons. The value of technology in search and rescue operations. The use of the Computer Aided Search Information Exchange, CASI, C -A -S -I -E, and infrared cameras help to streamline and focus the search for Randy. The, the power of perseverance. Despite the challenges and frustrations encountered during the search for Randy, the search and the investigation teams persevered and ultimately discovered his remains, bringing closure to his family, his colleagues, and his friends.